I'm Ann Collins Goodyear, co-director with Frank Goodyear of the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. And today I join you from the virtual galleries of the museum and specifically from our special exhibition, New Views of the Middle Ages, Highlights from the Wyvern Collection. In the face of a historic health crisis, when COVID-19 has significantly restricted our ability to gather in person, techno technology has been a lifeline for many of us in museums. This is certainly the case at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, which remains closed to the public along with the rest of our campus as a precaution against COVID-19 and where we are eagerly partnering with our faculty colleagues and students who have nimbly pivoted to online teaching and learning. This summer and fall, as we considered how to share art with students and how to give them the exciting immersive experience with historic objects traditionally provided by shows such as New Views of the Middle Ages, we explored anew the question of how digital strategies could pave the way for new modes of engagement, study, and enjoyment. Today, we have an opportunity to hear from a panel of cultural experts about how new tools of communication and visualization have affected the work they are doing and how these tools may in turn shape museum practice, scholarship, and broad exposure to the arts in the future. We are pleased to be joined by Catherine Geary, visiting assistant professor of art history at Bowdoin and former research associate at the Walters Museum in Baltimore. Curator of the exhibition that brings us together today, Kate has done a masterful job collaborating with students and reconceptualizing the work of the scholar and curator in our new environment. Kate will introduce our panelists and share more information about today's program. Thank you for being with us. Kate, over to you. Well, thank you, Anne. Um, thanks for uh, that introduction and thanks to everyone for joining us today in our virtual audience and of course to our panelists. It has been clear for some time that digital technologies have become a major component of how museums reach their audiences. And as new technologies have developed, especially over the last three decades, these have opened new doors for museums to reach more people and to engage with those people in new ways, both online and in the galleries. This past year, of course, we've seen museums around the world close their doors as we have wrestled with the COVID-19 pandemic. And perhaps one silver lining in this is that it has opened an opportunity to reevaluate the effectiveness of these various digital technologies, and perhaps even for us to envision some new paths forward. So this seemed like an excellent moment to have a conversation about these technologies and how they have changed and continue to change the relationships between museums, museum audiences, and the works of art themselves. We have invited a panel of speakers who represent different aspects of the museum world, all with an interest in the medieval period, but with experiences and insights that will be applicable to the larger questions around display and the availability of works of art from any period. So I want to start by briefly introducing our panelists, then I'm going to turn the mic over to them uh, in turn to uh, offer a kind of brief introduction of their own work and their own take on this larger issue. And then we will start the panel discussion at the heart of today's program. There will be some time afterwards at towards the end of the hour to take questions from our audience. And you can use the Q&A button in Zoom to pose a question. You can pose a question at any time or you can wait until the end. So our three panelists today are uh, Barbara Drake Bame from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Ayob Dorillo from the British Museum, sorry, from the British Library, and Sir Paul Ruddock, who has taken on leadership and advisory roles at many museums. Barbara Drake Bame is the Paul and Jill Ruddock Senior Curator for the Met Cloisters, where she has been a prolific curator and scholar. She has curated many blockbuster medieval exhibitions at the Met, including Jerusalem 1000 to 1400, Every People Under Heaven and Prague, the Crown of Bohemia. Her many publications on reliquaries, enamels, and other works of medieval art are fundamental reading for medieval art historians. And I know that students in many of my classes have had to read her work at some point. Ayob Dorillo is an expert in Ethiopian manuscripts. 
the particular interest in magic and divination within a Christian context. He works at the British Library in the Department of Asia and Africa Studies, where he has curated several exhibitions, including African Scribes, Manuscript Culture of Ethiopia, the first exhibition at the British Library devoted to their collection of Ethiopian manuscripts. He was also co-curator of the show Harry Potter, History of Magic. In addition to several articles on these topics, he has delivered a number of public talks and contributed to several BBC documentaries. Sir Paul Ruddick is a businessman, philanthropist, and patron of the arts who has a particular interest in the medieval period and has served in a number of key leadership and advisory roles at major museums. He was chairman of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London from 2007 to 2015. He is a trustee of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries in London, a former trustee of the Samuel, Colt sorry, the Samuel Courtauld Trust, and a former chairman of the Gilbert Trust for the Arts. Sir Paul has also been a very generous financial supporter of a number of arts and educational institutions, including Bowdoin College, the Courtauld Institute of Art, and the British Museum, among many others. And before we begin, I also want to introduce our moderator for today's panel, Sean Burris, the Andrew W. Mellon Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellow at the BCMA. Sean is a specialist in ancient and early medieval Mediterranean art, and one of his primary roles at the BCMA is to enable faculty and students to engage with the collection. And Sean has really made huge strides here to introduce and incorporate a number of digital technologies into the ways in which faculty use the college's collections for teaching and research. Sean has certainly worked closely with me and a number of other faculty members to explore new digital ways for students to engage with medieval objects. So he is well poised to lead this discussion. So uh, without any further ado, I want, to turn, I want to turn the mic over to Barbara Baim, who will begin. And I'm going to be also sharing my screen to show some slides on her behalf. So Barbara, you can begin whenever you're ready. Thanks so much, Kate, and thanks for starting us off with the first image that, uh, that you see now on your screen. I thought it would be helpful for us to begin here. This is a work of art that I've been thinking about from a, from a certain distance over the course of the summer. Um, and, and I think it, we can use it to get at once to the possibilities that some of our new technologies offer in understanding works of art as well as to some of the limitations. And I, I want to start with suggesting actually a real limitation. And that is that there is something visceral when you see a work of art um, that I experienced very strongly when I first saw and subsequently every time I see this particular object. I'm, I'm a specialist in manuscript illumination and goldsmith's work. So I was kind of uh, astounded by myself when I first saw this very masculine painted wood box and how I responded to it. It gets inside your head, a great work of art, that it's almost like a love affair. And that's something that only gets communicated fully when you are in the presence of, of, of a great work of art. But yet with this object, I've been able to bring it to the attention of our audiences in ways that I couldn't through our through just having it be in our gallery. So let me tell you something about that. <clears throat> First of all, this piece was uh, beautifully published in the Burlington Magazine before we received it on loan from the uh, from the collection of uh, of Sir Paul Ruddick. Um, but what I can tell you about it is that that Burlington publication um, didn't in any way communicate the power that is inherent in this art. And so uh, what, I, what we needed were some other ways to find that. We started off by simply having it be featured in a family program uh, that we did uh, years ago at the Cloisters where we talked about the legend of uh, Sir William of Orange and how that legend is uh, represented here. I then actually read parts of that legend at a gathering of patrons of the museum, but that too met a very limited audience. And the Burlington Magazine, as much as we might love it and as good as that article was, reaches a certain kind of pre-chosen audience. So, so what did we do to bring this work of art to life? Kate, could you show me the next slide, please? 
we use the Cloisters blog to represent the relationship between this object and the cloister of Saint Guillaume, Guillaume being both the knight represented on the box and subsequently the saint represented uh, in, in our cloister, um, a foundational uh, part of the building of the cloisters. And this allowed me as an author to get to some of the colorful aspects of this box that really would not be appropriate to a scholarly article, right? To talk about the joyful and funny uh, aspects of the, of the legend that come through. Next, please. I did that twice, first with that, that one called Founding Father and then this one called French Toast, um, which is a, a kind of salute to the story of saint -Guillaume. Um, and to get to the exuberance of medieval art that I think is not people's general understanding of it, right? When you look at our cloister, it has this kind of sober aspect. But when you look at the object itself, you can see that there's a kind of joyousness to it. Could I have the next slide, please? And I use that to actually then go on and talk about the relationship even between the story of saint -Guillaume and wines from the region still today and to link those to the medieval period. This is something I could never do in a scholarly article, right? And so we had a photograph of the wine that we were actually pouring that summer in the Cloisters Cafe, which comes from that region and has done since the medieval period and that bears the name Guillaume still. And then it allowed me too to put in some of the text that talked about those things. And you see that um, the troubadour, Guillaume the Ninth, uh, talked about a dinner in which, and I was quoting from it, the bread was white and the wine was good and the pepper thick. This gets to actually a personal thing of mine that I finally admitted like, you know what? I actually prefer a good white bread to uh, many things that are much healthier for me. So there was a kind of fun that we could bring in, uh, in talking about this. Next slide, please. And at the same time, we could show our own kind of seriousness of purpose by including in that blog post some further references for further reading. Next slide, please. This summer, I've been preparing um, some text about this coffret, uh, which will be part of a, an online series that we do at the Metropolitan Met Collects because this is now a promised gift to the Metropolitan. Um, and here I can do something that I also can't do very well in the gallery. And that is to show extraordinary details that you wouldn't see unless you had the privilege of holding this in your hands. Do you see those gray arrows that are piercing the, um, the flesh and piercing the shields of the men at battle and the intensity of their gaze? We can see that here in a way that is tricky to see in the gallery. Next, please. And just further to that, we can show a detail like this that shows uh, the beauty of these dappled horses. Do you see their beautiful pink spots and their black spots that to sort of, uh, again, evokes the kind of wonder in nature, um, the appreciation of horses that you have uh, witnessed in the Middle Ages. But there's something else going on here too. This uh, confrontation, this fight between these two knights is something extraordinary. And if you look closely, you will see that at the right, that not only is the shield uh, differentiated from the shield at the left, but that we have presented to us now uh, a competition between a Christian knight at the left and a Moorish knight uh, shown with dark skin at the right. And it allows us with this kind of um, detail, this kind of photographic image to talk about what that means about uh, that uh, long history that underlies uh, issues of uh, both religious pre prejudice and racism uh, that still uh, confront us today. So uh, I love what this particular object has allowed me to do to expand the kinds of conversations that I have uh, with the public. I'll pass it back to you, Kate. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. So now we will turn to Ayob Durillo. Thank you very much. That was a, 
very nice introduction. Um, so I was working at the British Library now for, well, I'm still working there for about five years, uh, pretty much working with the Ethiopian collection. Uh, the, the collection forms part of the foundation collection of the British uh, of the British Museum uh, manuscript collection. So um, in 2018, I uh, had this opportunity to put an exhibition together for the first time um, on the Ethiopian manuscript collection. Uh, and the objective of this exhibition was um, threefold. First, to highlight the Ethiopian collection, which didn't have that much um, exposure before outside of the scholarly or academic circle. Um, and then the second objective was also to not celebrate, but to sort of acknowledge how the main part of the library's collection of manuscripts came into being, which was after a primitive expedition of, of, uh, of 1868. Um, and then the third point was also to highlight uh, a digitization project that we we started around 2017 to digitize um, some 300 Ethiopian manuscripts. So it, it was a like I said, it was the first time that we did an exhibition entirely devoted to an Ethiopian manuscript. But it was also a way of, for me personally, highlighting uh, the close connection between Western or medieval manuscript tradition and Ethiopia. So I was very careful to select items that wouldn't um, you know, alienate those who were not familiar with um, Ethiopian studies. So for example, the first manuscript that, were, that was on display um, were the 13th century um, homely an act of martyrs, which was actually directly translated from po possibly a Greek or a Syriac source. Um, and it was interesting to display that because in the British Library, we also have uh, the martyr books, um, the Latin version. And juxtaposing both for me uh, and seeing the engagement of visitors, I found that very interesting. And I was also able to easily explain to them the similarities and, 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 and the differences. Um, and then the second point uh, of the exhibition, again, the, the manuscript that we were digitizing, um, it was very difficult to, to firstly select the items because uh, at one side we, you know, we knew that we had to give access to Ethiopian scholars who were particularly interested in the Magdala manuscript. So the Magdala manuscript was the highlight of this exhibition, which were uh, acquired in 1868. And as you can see, from this slide, um, I really loved the display, uh, although I didn't like the color at first. So when the exhibition team came up with the color, I was really not happy, but I, in the end, I really liked it because it appealed to children as well. Uh, so the, this, the display case had uh, three, four feet, the themes. The first was text. So manuscripts dating from 13th century to the 15th century. And the second was the art. So illuminated manuscripts. And in that we had some really beautiful uh, illuminated manuscript, royal, you know, deluxe, like bling manuscripts uh, to show to um, our visitors. And, and then the fourth case uh, focused on the book as an object. Um, this was also another message that I wanted to send that um, these manuscripts are not, ju are not just text carriers. They're also devotional books. So the way you handle a manuscript, the way you uh, place a manuscript in the church. You know, you kiss a manuscript, you bow down to it. It's, it. There's a lot of reverence to that. So I wanted to get that across. And then finally, uh, to sort of also talk about the intellectual contribution of the scribes and honoring the, uh, their, their, their works. Uh, as you can see in the second slide, this was one of the first manuscripts that um, we digitized. It's a huge manuscript. Um, it's a 15, it's a 14, 15th century uh, octitude. Uh, so that's the, the first 10 books um, from, from starting from Genesis, uh, I think up to Root. And it, it generated so much interest uh, in terms of not just the scholars, but the public out there. Firstly, 
um, our general audience were not, really, like I said, familiar with Ethiopia. So even associating Christianity, I've had some, I had some interesting questions. Um, and then on the other side, people sort of said, why didn't you have illuminated manuscript as opposed to text? Um, for me, the script, the text is also, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm in love with the scripts quite a lot, the Ethiopic script, uh, the philology, uh, the way how it's written, the way it has changed and sharing the, the writing, again, the, pre, you know, the misconception that Africa has a writing system you know, as well. So I wanted to kind of highlight that. And you know, going into lockdown, to date now, we have 304 manuscripts. So at that time, you know, we, we, it was a great opportunity now that I'm able, uh, you know, I don't have to go into work. So it's become a great opportunity to just go through them and use them and, and, and look at them. And finally, this, this image, I just want to share with you this, one of my favorite manuscripts, which is uh, the Nagara Mariam, which is roughly translate the history of Mary. It's a fifth century, originally composed in the Coptic work, uh, but we have several manuscripts that are beautifully illuminated. And this, and this manuscript really uh, is, is one of the, um, the best uh, to be displayed. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ayob. Um, so if you can, uh, yeah, there you go. Thank you very much. Okay, and now Sir Paul, if you'd like to say a few words. Yeah, th thanks, Kate. We might wonder why I'm on because I'm obviously not a specialist. I'm, a, I'm an amateur, but I've been very involved, as Kate said, with museums now for 25, 30 years. Uh, the VNA, the British Museum, the Met. And that really started out because as a child, I grew up in uh, the Midlands in England. But I got taken to National Trust houses by my parents and to museums. We grew up about a mile and a half down the road from a, a wonderful uh, medieval moated manor house. And I think it was the romance of the Middle Ages that uh, I was instilled with really from a, a very young age. And my parents bought me a copy of a 12th century chess set, the Lewis chess set for my eighth birthday. So I learned to play chess on that. So from a very early age, I've been sort of excited by the Middle Ages in particular. Um, but I think that today museums are particularly challenged. I think that's why it's relevant we're having this conversation. Uh, in a world where you actually can't visit a museum, you can't see the objects, uh, you do have to rely on other technologies. And just think about what we're doing now, this Zoom conversation. We couldn't have even done this three or four years ago. So it's extraordinary the advances that technology has made. And I think Barbara is absolutely right. You can't take away the magic of the unique object. And there is something still quite awe-inspiring about going in and seeing a great work of art for the first time. And in fact, just before we locked down again in England, we locked down again today. Um, there were a couple of shows that my wife and I went to. One was a show on kimonos at the v &A, and another was a show on the Arctic at the British Museum. And it was like a novelty going back in and seeing wonderful artifacts and designs. And digital at the moment isn't really a replacement for that, but it may become so through as, as VR and AR becomes better, we, we will see. But I think the other thing that fascinates me about the museum world and how technology can also bring this to life is cross-cultural connections. Um, some of the things that are in the show at Bowdoin, for example, there is a little diptych which has uh, an Ethiopian icon paired with a Cretan icon of about 1450. And Ethiopian art was very influenced by the Byzantine uh, world. Secondly, there is quite a lot of work from the so-called migration periods of the Huns, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, a period from really the late fourth century to about the seventh century. And what you can see there as well is how even 1500 years ago, fashions uh, migrated over uh, thousands of miles and styles which might pop up around the Black Sea were then being adopted in Anglo-Saxon England. So wh what is interesting, I think, is using technology to identify sources and materials. You can identify where the garnets come from. You can identify the, the sources of the gold and the silver. Uh, and also, as I think has been shown again from the wonderful catalog that Bowdoin has produced to go along with the exhibition, you can actually see through uh, things like uh, you know, X-ray analysis, much more clearly the skill 
of the craftsmen who made these objects. So I think it's um, very interesting in terms of what technology can bring to bear. And also in terms of veracity, using things like carbon-14 dating, thermal luminescence uh, analysis, uh, silver or metal composition analysis. These are things which are very difficult to do even 30 years ago. And today they're becoming uh, much more accurate. Uh, the, the databases that we can refer to are much uh, broader. And uh, this helps again, museums, collectors, etc., cetera, uh, have confidence in the objects that are within the collections, but also to understand the changes those objects have gone through over the centuries, where there may have been adaptations, alterations, repairs, and so on. So I think technology is increasingly uh, playing an important role. And the final thing I'll say, and maybe we'll get through to this in the uh, in the uh, the discussion, is I think the quality of 3D replication has improved uh, exponentially over the last five to 10 years with 3D printing and scanning. And that is a way that you may not be able to substitute uh, a replica for the uh, original, but you can certainly share that original in replica form with a vastly greater audience than if it is just sitting in one place. And I think we, maybe we can discuss that a bit later. So thanks, Kate, back to you. Thank you, thank you, Sir Paul. So I'm going to turn things over to Sean Burris and he will lead us in a discussion of some of these issues. And then, as I said before, at the end, we will have a few minutes left over for some questions from the audience, which you can ask through the Q&A feature. Sean? Absolutely, thanks, Kate. Um, and thank you to all our panelists for joining us uh, virtually today and for sharing um, those introductory remarks. I know we'll be revisiting many of the ideas that have already come up uh, throughout the course of this discussion. Um, I've been looking forward to this discussion quite a bit, so I wanna dive right in. And I wanna begin with a question um, that I think many of us are wrestling with at the moment. Um, as Sir Paul, you already alluded to, um, access to museums across the whole world has been restricted for over half a year now. And um, so I wonder, um, what is the difference between encountering art in person in the galleries, uh, whether they're the galleries of the British Library or um, the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, and encountering art virtually? And I wonder how you would each characterize that difference. Um, what opportunities have you been observing uh, that uh, accompany digital encounters with art? Um, and what have you found that's missing when we're looking at medieval art online? Can I make a stab at that, Sean? Absolutely. Right. So I think one of the things you miss right off the bat is scale. You've no idea if something is one inch high or six feet high. And that, I think, is something that is always surprising when you see objects in the flesh. So again, if you look at the exhibition you have on at the moment, you have a, a miraculous little boxwood prayer nut, which is just over an inch in diameter but you could blow it up and it could be 10 feet high on a screen and still look fantastic. Likewise, you, you've got stone sculptures in the exhibition that are four or five feet high, but you can't tell whether they're six inches or six feet high on the screen. So firstly, you miss that scale. And secondly, there is something also that you, you, you miss. There is, there is a, like a, a visceral resonance, which is almost programmed into our DNA when you see an object in the flesh. And some of that goes to the patina of the object, which you can't get on a screen. Some of it goes to the smell. I mean, if you go around an old church, the centuries of incense, uh, and some of it is just the hairs on the back of your neck. I don't know whether you've experienced it, but I do from time to time. When you see a fantastic work of art, you feel the hairs on the back of your neck uh, go up as, as you know, in the same way you might if, if there's danger approaching its excitement. And, uh, to my mind, digital, digital cannot yet uh, create those experiences. Though, as I said, it may do with the speed at which um, VR is, is progressing. Barbara, I, I think that goes to something that you already began to observe. I think you used the term love affair uh, mm -hmm. for looking at art. I wonder if you want to expand on that. No, it, it, that's absolutely right. And what Sir Paul said about hairs on the back of the neck, sometimes they'll, a, a great work of art will just bring me to tears. I can't stop it. Um, but I, I think we can make an analogy here. My family is obsessed with watching cooking shows. They watch Gordon Ramsay, right, of these things. And you see these, a lot. or what, back in the day it was Julia Child, right? And you see these elaborate preparations 
of meals and you come to understand more about the ingredients and where they come from and how they're combined at the end of the meal at the end of the program though you don't get to eat the food and you can't you don't get to smell it it's just what paul was saying and and there is i think an analogy here um you know you you also eat with your eyes absolutely hey, oh. I noticed in, in your introductory remarks, you already brought up the way that the manuscripts um, traditionally um, were the subjects of, of, of great veneration. You would kiss the books and, and so on and so forth, which goes again maybe to some of that question of a love affair with objects. But I'm really interested to hear your thoughts about this because your uh, comments brought to, to my mind the fact that already when we're encountering these objects in the museum context, we're, we're encountering them in a new context than they were historically um, ex exposed. So it, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on the virtual and in-person encounter. So, well, I mean, the digital encounter is obviously the advantage is, is, is vast as uh, Sir Paul and Barbara highlighted. Um, so when I'm doing my research PhD, I have to look at, you know, different manuscripts for a critical edition I'm producing. So, you know, in, from my bedroom, I can look at three, you know, five, six manuscripts at the same time. You know, I can zoom in and do all sorts of things, you know, uh, cut and paste, etc. And the, you know, the other advantage for us uh, in, the, uh, in the British Library is that the durability of the object, you know, it lasts long. So it's great for conservation. Uh, so much advantage to it. However, uh, you know, as a researcher or someone who loves art or understands art, the only way you can make um, sense or meaning of, or understanding of the object is, is having, is through having a sensory engagement with, with the material. Uh, you know, that way you learn about the attributes of the, mas the, the, of the manuscript, you know, through physical encounter, i.e. just looking at it uh you know touching and of course smell uh, you know for ethiopian manuscripts smell is so important because parchment retains uh, the smell so you know i have i've opened a manuscript once which last time was seen something like 1940s by one scholar and since then it just remained on the box and when i opened it the fragrance the frankincense from the smell i could just say to you you know i could tell you whether that manuscript belonged uh in a uh, church or a monastery or if it's a psalter owned by a monk the smell you know if it's a psalter you have the spice uh, the fire smoke because it's in the house so there's so much in terms of physically uh, you know they generate a, a sense of really coming close to the past uh, you feel that those objects, like, like, again, like Sir Paul said, they, they, they prompt strong reaction, you know, either surprise, shock, uh, they do ev evoke um, those emotions. And, uh, you know, luckily, I'm gonna get carried away, guys, because I was allowed to work in the, um, to go into the library. So I had, yesterday I was in the archives, half of, you know, from one o'clock to four o'clock by myself. And since the lockdown, you know, I was just working with digitized images, but to physically be in the archive by myself, pick up a manuscript and just smell it and look at it, it was, you know, it's, it's another way of experiencing uh, the book. I think I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs> yeah, but I think, I think just to come on to that, Sean, what I am saying, manuscripts are particularly interesting because you also can't tell digitally really about the, this, you can tell about the quality of the script, but not the necessary, the value to the commissioner. So in your exhibition, you've got one manuscript which was created for in 1399 for the, uh, the Chamberlain of the, uh, the Duke de Berry, the, 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 you know, the brother of the, the King of France. And the vellum is so thin, it's almost like tracing paper. And the, the value of that would have been hundreds of times that of something that was just made for a monk in the monastery, but also the skill to be able to illuminate that was extraordinary. And again, that is something that the digital can't replicate at all. Uh, and I and I think you you see that again. You know, understanding how objects were made, uh, sculptures, etc. Uh, 
again, you need to really look at these very close up. So the, the microscopic imagery we can get in digital is very helpful, but you sometimes miss the, miss the bigger picture. It's very interesting. You've all sort of posited a number of, of things that we're missing when we encounter digital along the lines of the physical or material, the tactile aspects, but also the emotional and the spiritual valences of art. So maybe we can tuck in the back of our, our minds for to, to end on a note of, of, of where we see the digital going and whether there's some any promise of overcoming those gaps. Um, but I want to move on um, to an, another question. Uh, it's often said today that uh, everyone's a curator. Whether we're using smartphones in exhibitions or we're using Instagram, Facebook, or Pinterest to consume images and to curate our lives, we're living in an era where access to art is increasingly democratized. So my question for the panel um, is, in this climate of, of democratization, what role is there for cultural institutions like museums and libraries, not only as, as repositories of great collections, but as repositories of expertise about art as well. Uh, okay, I, I'll take us. So, so all right. I, I disagree that uh, everyone's a curator. I mean, it's you know, uh, it, I'm no disrespect. Yes, there are great people out there posting, you know, amazing images on Instagram, Facebook, with, with great knowledge. Um, you know, they they. They, they do this, uh, but be, you know, curating, especially, uh, I can't speak for museums, but working in, 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 in the British Library, um, you know, it's not just about posting images or looking at images. Um, and there is the assumption that museum curators um, are people who just display beautiful objects. That's their job, you know, other than being awkward, you know, their job is just displaying. There's so much to it. This is just a fraction uh of the job um you know you know as, as a curator someone that's worked with the ethiopian collection for a long time um you know my, my sort of core priorities is this is quite a lot not this you know to maintain develop the printed collection the manuscript collection safeguard uh preservation conservation yeah, you know and then most importantly making this um items accessible this is really the real challenge, uh, you know, to the public, uh, not just to the Ethiopian um, scholars. So, and on top of this, you know, each activities I just listed, they also present like their own problem, like unique, you know, unique problem. Uh, and it's also dealing with these challenges. You know, when you set up an exhibition or you display an item, you, you have to appeal to people. You have to take people's advice. It's not, you know, as sometimes as a curator, you don't make the decisions. Uh, there's colleagues, teams that make the decisions. So it's, there's quite a lot. Um, obviously, the biggest challenge uh, for me is making the Ethiopian collection more accessible. Uh, so curation is a profession. That's what I just wanted to say. Maybe Barbara, as a museum profession, you can uh, give us your food. Well, um, for my birthday recently, I was given a month-by-month -month selection of carefully curated chocolates. <laughs> and <laughs> I thought, you know, it used to be that when people would ask me what I do and I said I was a museum curator, they would say, what's that? Now, now as you say, you can curate everything, in, including chocolates, which, by the way, are, are quite wonderful. But uh, I, I think the point that you made Ava, is, is really an important one. And um, if I can use an example from my own recent experience. Uh, last year at the Cloisters, we mounted an exhibition about the Komar treasure. Um, the Komar treasure uh, consists of a find of mostly jewelry, uh, and some coins that uh, were excavated uh, in the 19th century quite by chance and that in fact reflect the Jewish community of Colmar uh, on the eve of the Black Death. And just to give a, a little bit of, of the inflection that is possible when you work as a curator. So in the previous exhibitions of that material, it had actually been referred to as treasures of the Black Death. I felt very strongly that that gave 
the storyline to the disease and not to the community that had created them. And so I switched it around for the show, for our show and referred to it as the Colmar Treasure, a medieval Jewish legacy. I wanted to get at the notion of what was medieval Europe and was it in fact the homogenous, uh, the homogenous society that some people imagine, the homogenous Christian society, on the contrary, right? So just to take that particular example and bring to life, bring back to life this particular uh, Jewish community that was resident in that part of Alsace. Then I got a letter from a, a man who's a doctor living on Fifth Avenue, and he said to me, you know, I don't understand this notion of the Colmar treasure. If you talk, if you ask me, it looks like tchotchkes. <laughs> but he <laughs> couldn't understand the notion of treasure that didn't involve, you know, a diamond the size of the Koh-i-Noor diamond. Um, but what my job was to was to try to have people understand the notion of treasure as the preservation of culture, as the preservation of a legacy of a particular peoples in a particular place, and and what their aesthetic sensibilities were. And I think I think Sean Barbara has has nailed it because Malcolm Gladwell said that you can't really become an expert at something without spending ten thousand hours doing it, and of course anybody can curate. In the same way anybody can play the piano doesn't mean they're going to play the piano like Liberace and to sing Barbara's praises one of the seminal shows in my education about medieval art was the show that Barbara curated in 1997 at the Met on Limoges Romanesque enameling which just blew me away and that was based on huge amounts of research and knowledge and I think the role of museums and of curators is to keep on uh, adding to our knowledge about these former civilizations. So, of course, anybody can curate. You can put together a list of pretty uh, objects and, and put them on display, but the role of the curators, both Barbara and I have said, is much more than that. It's about preservation. It's about putting in context. It's about deep knowledge. It's about working with source communities about their understanding of the objects, how those objects fitted into the societies for which they were made originally. It's a very multi-layered complex story and great curators bring that story to life and share it with the, with the public. And it's not an easy role and it's something that takes many, many years of hard work and learning. Let's, I want to pick up on that, that question of storytelling uh, really quick. I, I, I think in a way you all nailed it um, uh, and, and, and answered the question brilliantly for us. But to focus on the question of storytelling, I wonder what you all think is the role of traditional museum strategies like publications and exhibitions in the current era. And how do we see those strategies changing as cultural institutions are, share, are exploring new avenues of communication in order to connect with the public and share medieval art and our knowledge about medieval art? Look, the amazing thing is now you can connect theoretically with billions of people around the world, which you could not have done in the pre-digital age where people, particularly at Bowdoin, they have to come up to Brunswick and physically visit the museum. So that is, that is an amazing opportunity uh, and it's an amazing opportunity to build you know symposia with experts around the world so you know if you look at this Barbara's in New York maybe she's in New Jersey at the moment you know I have an eye in London uh, you're in Brunswick that th that's amazing so I think that museums can reach out to a much greater audience uh, and you've just got to be, be selective because of course every museum is doing that. So you've got to make sure that it's interesting and it's relevant and, uh, and, and take feedback from, from those audiences as to how to improve it. I think, I think there, I have to also add, uh, yeah, I think I agree with Sir Paul that you do have to take in short advantage of this new, new um, you know, technology and then, you know, provide uh cultural institutions to have more reach reach out for more and uh, you know make again going back to making this the objects uh available but in my case when i'm working with ethiopian manuscript um when sarah paul compared the crete the crete icon with ethiopia in terms of manuscript there are so much strong similarities between europe you know european manuscripts and ethiopian manuscripts that sometimes you know i look at the book of Kells. 
And then I look at uh, one of our um, Ethiopian 15th century manuscripts. The patterns, the, there's so much similarity. And this is where it is also crucial for us working in museum to provide uh, a context about the history of these items and more broadly about the history of the interaction, whether if there was possibly a, 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 an interaction with, with other nations. So when we're digitizing, cataloging, it's crucial that we also highlight those possible interaction. And there was interaction, I mean, uh, Ethiopian manuscripts, you know, reached Europe, well, probably before the 14th century. Uh, so making those connections and bringing context for me it's 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 really important i think i would just add that the same object can tell a multitude of stories uh and and that's part of what i was trying to suggest about the coffer that i showed at the beginning right when we when we had uniquely our cloister to tell the story uh, that's a certain chapter in the life of Sangiem. Uh, which is utterly different from the story that is told by the painted box about his earlier and more militaristic past. Um, and even just taking the same object and moving it around, it, it, it always astounds me how I see things differently when I change the gallery that they're in or I juxtapose them to something else. Thank you all very much. That's fascinating. So I want to note that I have one last question for the panelists, and then we're going to turn to our audience to continue the Q&A. For those of you watching along at home, if you have any burning questions, now would be a good time to enter them in using the Q&A feature on your screen. Uh, the questions you enter will be visible only to those of us on the panel and not to your uh, fellow attendees. So for the panel, and actually uh, returning and picking up on a thread in some ways, um, as we're observing all of these new multiple ways of telling stories about the same objects and connecting with uh, more and more audience um, in this era of expanded and democratized access, we've also all seen renewed and often quite welcome public attention to some of the more difficult or challenging questions in our field of medieval art history, from issues of cultural heritage to legacies of cultural conflicts. So my question is, as we are reaching larger audiences, uh, expanding our reach and taking advantage of these new platforms, how can cultural institutions not only take advantage of those, but also really responsibly share medieval objects and their very complex histories? Um, Barbara, you already alluded to some of this a little bit with the Colmar, uh, the Colmar treasures. Um, I, I, I wonder if you want to start us off. Um. Sure. I, I've been thinking of it uh, almost all the time these days, right? Because everything, everything about our current world is, is so present uh, and not in easy ways, I would say. So you don't find yourself only thinking about the Black Death, uh, which is, of course, a temptation when in the middle of the COVID circumstance. But I find myself thinking about the Moorish knight um, in on the back of our coffret. I find myself actually also thinking about uh, we, we're currently uh, we're currently restoring our tapestry of King Arthur, and I find myself thinking about what is the understanding of the role of a hero in our day? Who qualifies as a hero? What do you have to be? It, it, it's similar to the question about what what is a saint, but how do you how do you what makes a secular hero? Um, and I think that the trick when you're looking at a historical object is not to collapse history. You have to be careful not to collapse it and say that everything is exactly the same, but to somehow allow things uh, historical to inform our wider sense of, I guess, what you might call the human dilemma, um, which we can see uh, so so beautifully in works of art sometimes. No, I think that's right. I think there are these much broader cultural stories. So, you know, if I just do a romp through the 14th, 15th, 16th century, there was a massive change in the 14th century because of the Black Death. We're coming out of it 
society became very exuberant and rather uh, extravagant in, in its tastes and its art. And it's very interesting to see why that might have been. Maybe because people viewed life as fragile and short and they just wanted to, to uh, you know, have a good time. If you look at the ch changes which the Renaissance brought to Northern Europe around 15, 20, 15, 30, you see a shift again, two objects in the, in the exhibition. One is a Limoges painted enamel around 1500, showing the Virgin and Child. And the other is a Limoges enamel, maybe 30, 40 years later, which is a classical scene of young Cupid's playing called Youth. And that had as much to do with what was going on in Italy and taste, but it also had to do with the Reformation and the diminution of the veneration of idols because of Lutheranism and Calvinism and so on. So I think there are just much more complex stories you can tell around these objects, um, which reflect in, 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 in reflected today in many ways with the, uh, the battle between secularism and religion, which you're seeing going on in many parts of the world, and, and also the, the, uh, the economic challenges that much of the world face. You can reference those by what we see in the art of the Middle Ages. Well, I'm we're currently at the, at the library where um, sort of writing a new web, not the web page, but um, collection guide. So we're updating it. And one of the things we're doing is we're trying to sort of um, explain about the provenance of our collection, uh, you know, the story. And again, what I, what, what I was saying before was providing, you know, a, a context to, this, to the history of this item. Uh, but also more broadly about the interaction between the different nations that have had these objects, the exchange. Um, you know, so, so looking at uh, one, one particular interesting example is at, at the British Library, the, the earliest or the first two early manuscripts are part of the Harley collection. So this is the foundation collection of the British Museum. So Harley gave his um, Latin manuscript and uh, Hebrew manuscript, but among them, there, there are two beautiful uh, prayer books, uh, one uh, from Mary, and I think it's the 15th century. And I've always been really fascinated how Harley got those items in his collection. And so far, I mean, uh, you know, Harley has, his people have written quite a lot on, on his other collection, but not so much um, on this, on the Ethiopian collection. Actually, actually, nothing exists other than the, 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 the catalogue entry so using the object to also talk about the test in europe at the time what interested them about ethiopian manuscript you know it didn't start today or it didn't start with a punitive expedition loot it started earlier like i said like in the 14th century where um you had travelers coming back uh, scholars who were actually uh, mostly theologians who were actually looking for lost early biblical work and yeah through you know through this providing this context and i i think uh, our audience would really find that interesting uh, not just knowing what the object um, is about but also knowing its history and its interaction between these different nations it's fascinating. Thank you all very much. So we have time now uh, to take a few questions from the audience, and our Q&A is filling up, and there's some really great questions in there. So I'm going to invite uh, Kate to join us again and um, help uh, introduce some of the audience questions. Thank you, Sean, um, and thanks again to our panelists. It was really lovely to have a chance to hear your thoughts on these questions. Um, so we have one question to start off with. Do you think some categories of objects that is reliquaries versus manuscripts versus paintings, resist digitization more than others? In other words, uh, do you think some object types, it matters more to see them in person than for other types? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm hoping to have more manuscripts digitized in 2021. Uh, but in terms of manuscripts, in terms of e I mean, Ethiopian collection uh, in Europe, manuscripts have have received more um, digital attention i guess you could say digitized they've been there's quite a few people working but in terms of museum collection um, they've been really neglected i haven't seen any um, anything new happening in 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 the british museum so uh 
I think, yeah, people are probably favoring manuscripts more than other historical objects. There, there is a change, though. Um, you know, I've been quite involved with a group called Factomate, who operate out of Madrid, who have, been, who have really pioneered high-res uh, digital scanning and digital printing. For, so, for example, they've made replicas of some of the destroyed monuments in Iraq, which are almost uh, you know, interchangeable with, with, with what the originals would have been. Uh, you don't get that patina of smell that I talked about, and, and, and well, but digital replication now is getting unbelievably accurate to the, the degree you can actually get the same weathering and uh, you know, coloring and, and so on. So I, I do think it's an area which is interesting. I've been pushing it as an area to travel fragile treasures to places where you would not otherwise take them, where places where you have conservational security issues. So I think we started with digital primarily in things like manuscripts and, and images, but I think it is moving very rapidly into three-dimensional objects as well. And I think that's has huge potential for museums in terms of outreach and education to travel objects to a much broader audience when you can't take the originals because of either conservation or security issues. So and another uh, question. Uh, no, I just wanted to also say, because when, when Sarah Paul said about travel, the other big issue as well that we have is also the technological divide. Um, you know, in the case of Africa, where you have no, almost no access to internet. That, that also you know, presents really difficult challenges for, 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 for museums as well. Uh, I mean, in the case of you know, students in Addis Ababa University, they're constantly emailing me, asking me if I can send them a PDF copy of a manuscript. And you know, I, I can't, I can't you know, not a lot, you know, obviously I can't create the PDF, but this is because they don't really have, um, they don't have internet connection. So sometimes there is, uh, you know, there's also the disadvantage to what we, what, you know, what we're doing as well. It actually relates a little bit to the next question. Um, I'll just quickly summarize it. You know, we've been talking a lot about using digital tools to bring these works outside of the museum, but do you see room in the galleries for some of these tools? Is there a way that digital technologies can enhance the experience of visitors who are actually in the museum space? They um, can, I think our experience, uh, sorry, Barbara, I'll just make one point, is it changes so rapidly that um, it's very, very expensive for museums to do that. And if you have it in permanent displays, you find that when it breaks after a year or two. So I think it's problematic. It can, and Barbara will talk to her experience where she has used it. But I think it's uh, in a perfect world, yes. But the reality is if you do it in a substandard world way give, because of lack of funds, given how used people are to seeing Hollywood type productions, one's got to be a little careful that it detracts from the magic of the real objects. Uh, thanks. I, 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 I would point to two things. One is that most people are actually more comfortable looking at digital representations or photographic reproductions than they are looking at original works of art. So what I've observed sometimes, for example, in a manuscript exhibition, if you have the open book and next to it the uh, illuminated, lit up page that you can't see, people will look at the pages they can't see because they're used to looking at things on screens. And then they will just keep walking. They won't look at the real work of art. And that, I think, is something you have to be really alert to because our job is to make sure people experience the real work of art. I would bring up a specific example of this. Kate, you have a slide of what we did with the boxwood pieces when they were at the cloisters. And you have, in the Wyvern Collection uh, exhibition, now at Bowdoin, you have one of these tiny, tiny prayer beads, right? You look at the diameter of the thing, it's, it's under two inches, like 4.8 centimeters. People are fascinated by this tiny world that you can tumble into when you look at these works of art. And that's, uh, we wanted to sort of get the mystery of that in the exhibition. And then there was in Toronto, at, at the first uh, iteration of the exhibition, a virtuality uh, experience, the VR experience, and I was very resistant to it. 
uh, until they offered to do it for us for free. Um, and, and, and with the added information that a group of nuns had come to the exhibition in Toronto and proclaimed it to be a highly spiritual experience. I thought, well, it's not for me to say that it's inappropriate if the nuns think it was highly spiritual. So we did do it at the cloisters, but we did it as education programming. So we didn't juxtapose it in the gallery to the original works of art. We set up specific days and times when you could participate in this. Um, and that, and, and it was in a different part of the building so you then were to travel you had to travel from the exhibition to this other location where you could do this kind of dive into the object itself and what you're seeing on the screen uh is in fact a franciscan brother uh having this particular experience he's dressed in black he wasn't in his uh, official gear but that it gives you a, it was really for many people a very special kind of experience so I think, yes, it can work, but you have to be um, alert to those kind of uh, caveats. Kate, I would say that one of the areas it does really help is QR codes. And as gradually as museums are able to put QR codes on all their objects, instead of, you, you can then have a simple label, but then you can get a lot more information by, de by you know, scanning the QR code into your uh, handheld phone or what have you. So I think it is, for people that are really interested, it is a way that they can learn a lot more. The danger, of course, is they end up walking around the museum looking at their phone, not looking at the objects. So it's trying to balance those the, that attention. Well, on that note of, of balance, and also, Barbara, I, I love hearing that story about the nuns, because that brings us full circle to that question of the spiritual and the um, uh, visceral experience. Um, I'm afraid that we have uh, run out of time and have to wrap up. Um, but I want to thank each of you, um, Barbara, Ayob, and uh, Sir Paul for joining us today. Kate, it's been a pleasure to work with you and your students on this exhibition. And I've really enjoyed this conversation that um, if, if only we had another hour to continue. But uh, thank you all for joining us and thank you to the audience as well. Thank, thank you, you everyone. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. See you.